Amen. Brother Urshan, we love you. Come to this old pulpit. Take your liberty. Everyone say, God bless Brother Urshan. Thank you, Pastor Adams. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? How many love the name of Jesus this morning? Oh, praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. You're good to us, Jesus. You're good to us, mighty King. Amen. I'm in love with Jesus this morning. And I love being around people who are in love with Jesus. And I can feel the presence of God. I could feel it when I heard the praises walking into the building. Amen. And it's wonderful to be here and to join in with fellow Memphians. <laughs> Praise God. I've got Memphis, I've got Tennessee, I've got Mississippi in my blood. And it's just, it's just there. And it comes out at very different times. <laughs> Praise God. I'm uh, very grateful to be here and to minister with you here. And it's always an honor and a privilege to be with um, Pastor Adams and his, his wife. And the ministry that they have here is uh, such a testimony to what God can do. And I know that the future is bright here at Christian Life Tabernacle. Amen. We serve a great God. And, and God's church is a victorious church. And I like to be around people who got the devil on the run. Amen. Amen. Um, if you have a Bible, I'll go ahead and jump right to the word of the Lord this morning. Um, it is true. We actually leave in February, early February for Honduras. And um, we are working with different pastors. There is a church down there uh, that was established a few years ago. It does need help. Um, it needs help with some... Uh, spiritual stability and it needs help with uh, building projects and um, I'm going down there to do a little bit of both Nehemiah um, he he ministered he built with a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other hand and I know how that works and I'm excited to get about the business down there in Honduras and hopefully God can do a great work he will do a great work amen um, if you have your Bible, I'm reading from James chapter 2. While you're turning there, don't you just love Thanksgiving Sundays? Seems like, uh, Pastor Adams, that whenever I would have a guest preacher come in, all my folks would stay home. I was wanting everybody to come out, and we were going to have a big Holy Ghost time. And I don't know, it was like a memo went out. Don't come to church. <laughs> and uh, it was just one of those things. I don't know what it was. And then the weirdest times, you know, there'd be nothing going on, and the place would be packed wall to wall, and I would want to just say, now you come? <laughs> it's just the joys of pastoring. Praise God. James chapter 2 and verse 14, one of my favorite portions of Scripture. The apostle says, what doth it profit? My brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, and this question right here that he asks is a question that a lot of people in our world ask. And the question is, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what? doth it profit even so faith if it hath not works is dead being alone yea a man may say thou hast faith I have works show me thy faith without thy works I will show thee my faith by my works thou believest that there's one God thou doest well the devils also believe and tremble but wilt thou know O vain man that faith without works is dead and here's a phrase that the religious world does not like was not Abraham our father here it is justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God 
and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Praise God. I want to take a minute today, and um, the Lord laid this on my heart. I hope it can help. I hope it can edify. I want to preach a simple message on a Sunday morning. I want to preach Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. Look at the person next to you. Tell them, I want Bible faith this morning. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Is it all right if I talk about faith a little while today? Um, I'm going to say at the outset that faith is a heavily contested topic. And, uh, you know, I, I hope I can edify somebody today because I know the devil has fought me in the arena of faith, particularly when I was younger in the ministry. I, I was developing what I understood and I was wrestling with doctrines and trying to figure out why I believed what I believed. And the devil tried to define faith for me. You got to be real careful because if you let the devil define it, he's more than happy to. Um, the more leverage you give to him, the, the more leeway he'll have in your life. And I made up my mind that I was going to embrace a saving faith. I wanted, I wanted scriptural support and foundational teaching. I wanted edifying faith. That word edifying, it comes from the word edifice, and it means a building. It means a structure. I want a faith that is strong. I want a faith that is built on a foundation, to use a building term. Um, I, structurally sound. When the storm comes, I don't want my faith to collapse. Amen. When, when, when judgment comes, I don't want it to spring a leak. But I want my faith to float. I want my faith to be watertight. Spend time on your faith. And I, I believe that people who know who they are, I believe they are stronger for it. Um, if we allow the devil to define who we are, I'm afraid we'll wind up with a faith that is unable to save. We'll wind up, wind up with a doctrine that is unable to deliver. Uh, the Bible has words for that. It calls, uh, it calls doctrines like that, it calls, it calls them, rather, doctrines of devils. That's a Bible phrase. Every time I hear that phrase, I think of a council of devils sitting around a boardroom table with a head demon at the top of it, sending out memos and crafting satanic doctrines. How can I make apostolics stop believing in Jesus' name? I know what we'll do. We'll just tell them that you just have to believe and nothing else. You just have a little mental thought and you just gain your confidence and boom, just like that, you're saved. That will send them hell pretty quick. Send them to hell pretty quick. Doctrines of devils. Uh, <laughs> another term that is used is seducing spirits. Seducing, it's, it's, it called it seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seducing, seduction has to do with uh, enticement. It has to do with drawing you away from where you are by making something look better, by making something look appetizing, by making something look uh, good to the eyes. It's what caused Eve to finally grasp the fruit when she saw that it was good to eat. And it beckoned to her, it called to her, and finally, she yielded to, to temptation, and that's a seducing spirit. I believe that all false doctrine is 
seductive. Um, I actually believe it's a little easier to believe false doctrine than it is truth. Because there is a spiritual assault that comes when you stand for truth. Amen. As long as you go with the flow, as long as you go where the current takes you, as long as you stay in sync with the stream of this world and what the Bible calls the course of this world, amen, then you're not going to face a lot of resistance. But if you ever stop and say, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. Wait a minute. I've been reading in the book of Acts, and I'm reading something that they never taught me at my church. What is this Jesus name stuff? What is this baptism stuff? What is this Holy Ghost stuff? Why are they speaking with other tongues? And, and why does it happen repeatedly? And you'll get a lot of people that try to get you to go along with the flow. They'll try to pry you out of the book of Acts and crowbar you out of the book of Acts. Amen. But I'm not here today to go with the flow. I'm here today to lift up my eyes. I'm here today. David said, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I'm here to find out what thus saith the word of the Lord. Amen. And so there's an assault and, and, and truth requires aggression. It, it caused Jesus to say that the kingdom suffereth violence. And the violent taketh the kingdom by force. And it caused one writer to tell us that we were to earnestly contend. Truth must be contended for. I don't plan on giving up one inch of what my forefathers bled for. My forefathers bled for this Jesus name doctrine. My forefathers sweated for this Jesus name doctrine. They paid the price. They purchased real estate. They fought for it. They faced ridicule for it. They faced mockery for it. And the devil's not going to get one inch of this one God Jesus name message. Contrary, I'm actually going to take some ground. I'm actually going to move into the devil's territory and say, that ground is not yours. That ground is mine. I'm walking in the grace of God. I'm built upon a firm foundation. I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. And I'm taking ground. Ah, hallelujah. Earnestly contend. Not temporarily contend. Not half-heartedly contend. Not every once in a while contend. But earnestly contend for the faith. For not a faith. The faith. The, the specificity. The directedness I meaning I exclude all other faiths <laughs> the faith that was once delivered that means it couldn't have been delivered in 1600s it couldn't have been delivered in 325 AD it couldn't have been delivered hallelujah in any of the denominal restorationist movements where people got revelations like the just shall live by faith and it caused them to rebel against Catholicism and works oriented things and praise God I'm glad for every revelation of truth that every man gets in this world but that's not when the faith was given the faith was given on the day of Pentecost Amen. It was once delivered unto the saints. And, and that's what we have to contend for. That's what we have to get our hands around and say, I'm not going with the flow. You will never experience more adversity than when you realize something's not right and you stop going with the flow. You plant your feet on the stream bed and you stand up. The moment you stand up, all of the pressure of the flow goes against you. The moment you say, I'm not going to just do what people tell me, I'm going to read my Bible. Right. Amen. Right. There is a pressure as all of, the, all of the rush and all of the flow, you know, the, the, the habits, the cultures, the traditions, the race dynamics, um, all of the things that are familiar to people around you that you know and love, they will come at you like a raging, rushing river course. And it's designed to push you back into alignment and make you forget what you heard at that little apostolic church. 
make you forget what you read in the book of Acts chapter 2. It's designed to get you back into the flow and the course of this world. Hallelujah. It takes a man and it takes a woman to stand up and say, I'm not going with the flow. I'm not going to do something just because everybody else does it. But I'm looking for something more than that. I actually want God's favor and I want his will in my life. Hallelujah. And, and, and you can try to get me back into alignment, but I'm not going back in there. I'm going to walk against the current of this society. I'm going to... Man, I didn't mean to preach all that, but I'm just trying to tell you that there is a faith. There is a... There is a... There is a faith. I, I want to talk about that. Um, I actually told myself I was probably going to slow down a little bit this morning. But the problem with that is I get excited about the Word of God. <laughs> uh, if you stick around long enough, you're going to find out that <clears throat> there's a lot of different definitions for faith. What is faith? What, I mean, is faith, is it a, is faith confidence? I've been serving God just long enough to know that faith is not confidence. Confidence is something you can feel when things are going good. Confidence is something you feel when there's lots of friends with you. You can feel a sense of strength and you can say, oh man, I've got faith, we can do this. But, but the Bible actually shows God knocking those humanist supports out from under men of God. As he taught them, you don't walk by your strength, you walk by my strength. Gideon had confidence as long as he had 20,000. But when God whittled it down to uh, around 10,000, it got a little shaky. But well, okay, maybe I can do that. And then God knocked the other support out and knocked it down to 300. And God took away his confidence on purpose. Amen. God actually said, you have too many people for me to give you the victory. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. I'm afraid that when this is done, you're going to think you did it, Gideon. I'm afraid when this is done, you're going to think it was by your arm and by your power and by your... So I've actually got to remove your strength. I've got to remove your confidence. I've got to take away the trust that you have in this life. And in today's lesson, Gideon, you are going to learn that the Lord is great. And he's greatly to be praised. You're going to learn that I am your portion i am the one that lifts up and i am the one that tears down and i am the one that kills and i am the one that makes alive and hallelujah i know you know it in your head gideon but you're gonna know it down in your guts when i get finished with you because i'm gonna give you a victory by faith i'm gonna you're not gonna be confident you're gonna be scared you're gonna be afraid but you walk by faith and not by sight and i operate like that oh hallelujah god told zerubbabel zerubbabel it's not by might and it's not by power but it's by my spirit saith the lord faith got to walk by faith so we we say all right I got to have faith and we clench our eyes tight and we grit our teeth and we say faith 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 okay there there it is that's faith <laughs> you got to psych yourself up <laughs> look in the mirror and say all right you can do it you can do it all right faith there I go Uh, I think there's a little more to it than that. Um, I have felt miserable and still walk by faith. I have worried that I was going to die and I still walk by faith. Faith doesn't have anything to do with your emotions. It doesn't have anything to do with your feelings. It has to do with whether or not you're willing to keep on keeping on in your obedience to the word of God with enemies around you and with predators lurking and, and with adversaries 
threatening, you still put one foot in front of the other and say, this whole thing could blow up in my face, but I trust you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It prompted great men to, to put their confidence in God when all, uh, all, all of chaos was breaking loose in their life. And, and it caused David to say things like, the Lord is my light and he's my salvation. Whom shall I fear? It's one thing to say that in the comfort of a, of a tabernacle with, with a padded pew and, and carpet and, and safety. And it's one thing to say that there. It's another thing when Saul has patrols roaming through the woods. And when people you're helping are treacherously giving you up. And when your wife has been given away to another man. And you're alone with the rejects and the misfits of society. But in the middle of all of that, David says, The Lord is my light and he's my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Hallelujah. Faith. Ah. Uh, I actually believe that faith can go against every natural instinct. The greatest feats, the greatest exploits of faith came about when everything natural said, there ain't no way. Amen. Uh, Sarah's body told her, there ain't no way. I know, I know a little bit about what that's like. We went and played ball the other day. And uh, my son is almost 17. And, and he is able to uh, do things that I once was able to do. And it is very angering. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm still 18. In my mind, I still got this. In my mind, I can dunk a basketball. My body, however, is another matter. And my body says, there ain't no way. The only thing you're dunking is donuts down at Krispy Kreme. (laughs) The only thing you're going to do is watch that little boy go screaming past you. And there's not a blessed thing you can do but just hold on to him for dear life. (laughs) Sarah's body said, there ain't no way. Abraham's body, the Bible says, was as good as dead. Yet, yet, through faith, they receive strength to conceive seed. Amen. They staggered not at the promises of God, but were strong in faith, believing that he was able to perform that which he had promised Amen. And though everything around you naturally says, no, God can say yes. Amen. I I, I know that when Abraham began walking up the mountain with Isaac, don't tell me he felt good about it. You put yourself in that man's shoes. There's no father in the world that would feel good about what was getting ready to take place. And I want to say this here at the outset. I don't believe faith is blind. I know we don't walk by sight. But that doesn't mean faith is blind. Trusting in God is not ignorance. Trusting in God is not foolishness. Amen. God's not going to ask you to do something crazy and something insane. I know folks that I had a girl one time who came and she wanted to give 90% of her paycheck to the Lord. Um, And part of me was like, praise God. And another part was, another part was, hold on just a second. (laughs) I'm all about faith, but I'm also about balance. And I'm also about trusting it. Now, if God miraculously told you that, well, then hallelujah, we'll go for it. But I've been pastoring just long enough to know that insane doesn't mean faith. And I I, I talked with her, and and I said, you know, you might run into some difficulties. And she said, no, I believe God told me. I said, all right, we're going to find out. Well, about two weeks later, she was back. She said, I think I might have made a mistake, Pastor. (laughs) Amen. I'm not not trying to... to, um, Tell everybody to go out and do something crazy for Jesus. That's not what faith is. Faith is when God speaks to you. You know God speaks to you and you dare to believe it. Uh, You pray about it. You consider the scriptures. You take the time. You're consulting with the man of God. And then you realize there is a way. There is a purpose. And by faith, we're going to do this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I don't believe Abraham felt good about what God asked him. God said, take thy son, thine only son, and offer him up. Now, this was something God had given him. This was something he had agonized over for years. This was something he paid a great price for. And now this boy, his heir, God has asked him to to sacrifice him. And Abraham begins to to walk up uh, Mount Moriah. And as he walks up, with every step he takes, every paternal fatherly instinct in him is saying, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't, don't. Any father, it goes against the grain of a father to do this. The father protects. The father provides. The the father builds. The father prepares for the next generation. Abraham's going against everything. I don't believe that you're always going to feel good when it comes to faith. I don't believe it's going to be an emotional high. I don't believe you can psych yourself up for it. I think you just have to trust in God. You just have to believe in God and say, I might be feeling terrible, but the word of God says this, and I'm going to obey the word of God. I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to give him my confidence. Amen. And when I say faith is blind, here's what I'm, it is not blind. Here's what I mean. Abraham didn't walk up there without doing a little considering Abraham didn't just say well okay and go walking up there Abraham had something every one of us has here today Abraham had God's promises oh hallelujah Abraham knew a little something here's where the faith came in amen Uh, God had told Abraham that in thee and in thy seed Shall all the families of the earth be blessed? You're going to have children as many as the sand by the seashore. And as many as the stars of heaven. So, the Bible says, shall thy seed be. And God then said, take thy son, thine only son, and offer him as a sacrifice. Now, Abraham wasn't born yesterday. Abraham got to looking at the scriptures. Whenever you're going to walk by faith, make sure you look at the word of God. He didn't have a Bible to thumb through, but he knew what God had told him. Amen. And Abraham got to thinking to himself as he's walking up that mountain. I don't like this. I don't want to do it, but I know something. One thing I know is God cannot lie. Amen. And because God cannot lie, he said, I'm going to have seed as many as the stars of heaven and sand by the seashore. He looked around and he realized something. Isaac doesn't have any kids yet. Amen. So what that means is Isaac has to have kids. Amen. God cannot lie. So shall thy seed be. This boy is going to have children. He doesn't have any children at all today. So I don't know how it's going to happen. But what I do know is this boy is coming back off of this mountain with me. I don't know how. Either God's going to spare him or God's going to raise him up from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure, Paul said. But one way or another, I've got a promise from God. And I'm walking in faith. And I'm believing in God. God, ah, I got a little knowledge about this. I'm Abraham believing God wasn't that God wouldn't kill Isaac. It was that Isaac was coming back off that mountain with him. <laughs> Man, I feel rotten, but I'm going to do it anyway. And he walked up that mountain in faith. Amen. Praise God. I've given building fund pledges that when I did, my hand was almost unable to write the checkout. (laughs) What were you thinking? (laughs) I know y'all are far too spiritual for that. But I've been caught up in the moment in the service and said, yes, I'll give everything. And then later on when that moment died, I... (laughs) I said, man, you're an idiot, man. What are you doing? (laughs) And I said, God gave it to me, and I'm hanging on to it. Amen. And every single time, God has prospered me. God has made up the difference. God has used it for his glory. There is a knowledge that you have walking in that God cannot lie. (laughs) I believe that's what David did. 
when he walked out to face the lion. Uh, no man in his right mind wants to face a lion. Um, you're talking about five, six hundred pounds of bestial strength against a youth. Not a man in the world can stand against it unless you uh, have a, an AK-47. Then I would feel a little more comfortable. But that would be confidence. That's not faith. Amen. And, and so, so David walks up and the Bible says that he smote the lion. And you ask yourself, man, he must have been a superman. He must have been some kind of a, uh, where in the world do you get that kind of courage? I believe it comes from the same place Abraham's faith came from. Amen. David had a promise just like Abraham had a promise. David cast back in his, when he heard that first growl, that first snarl in the underbrush. Hallelujah. Back in his mind, he had a, a, memory, a, a memory, a remembrance of an old prophet coming to the house of Jesus. Jesse and pouring oil on his head and saying you're going to be the next king of Israel David looked around in that field and said I don't see a crown and I don't see a throne and I don't see servants I'm not king yet God said I'm going to be king and what that means is I don't know how but I'm not dying today I'm going to die but it's not today I'm going, I'm going to lay down but it's not right now so one way or another that lion is going down in the name of Jehovah and he walked out in the power of his promise and by faith, by faith, by faith, David. Oh, somebody grab a hold of your faith this morning and say, I got a promise from God. I've got the scripture behind me. I'm going to make it. I'm not going to die. I'm not going to fail. I'm not going under. By faith. It's promise based. Not only is it promise based. It's activity based. <laughs> and I've been preaching for a little while here. Let me hurry. My wife always tells me, baby, you went kind of long today. <laughs> My boys had a guest preacher come through and they said, oh, good. We love it when he comes. I said, you really enjoy his ministry? Oh, yeah, he doesn't preach long at all. <laughs> hey, praise God. Activity-based. There's, a, there's a, a spirit in this world today that says that you can be saved by doing nothing other than Believing. And the scripture describes it and it calls it faith without works. And the question asked was, can faith save him? If you've been around the apostolic church any length of time, you're going to know that we preach that a man and a woman needs to repent. Of their sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins and God will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost and the Bible describes that you will speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance and that's what we call the new birth. It's, it's to be born of the water and to be born of the spirit. And there is a, 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 a movement in our world that says you don't need that. And they'll say, well, we're not saved by works. <laughs> Did you know that Martin Luther actually tried to disqualify the book of James from the Bible? He tried to take his scissors and cut it out. He didn't like it because of the phrases contained in chapter 2 where it says that Abraham was justified by works. Martin Luther was coming from a Catholic background. He was a monk. He was a, a scribe. He, he would write down the scriptures and one day uh, being dissatisfied with abuses that he saw. He, he saw practices that weren't scriptural. He saw people giving money for the forgiveness of sins that called it indulgences. And he saw them um, 
uh, sprinkling babies. And he noted that's not in the scripture. And, and he, he saw a host of things, a uh, hundred some things wrong that he noted. And he, he wrote about it. And, and one day uh, in, in the book of Habakkuk, the Bible says that he was reading, or history teaches that he was reading in the Bible, where it says that the just shall live by his faith. And it jumped off the page at him and he got a revelation that you don't have to confess to a priest. You confess to Jesus Christ. That there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And revelation poured into that Catholic monk's mind and he formed the Lutheran denomination. It's another lesson for another day, but it's a good truth. It's It's a very real truth. The problem with those kinds of things, however, is oftentimes when you are at one extreme, your knee-jerk reaction is to react, and you go to the other end of the spectrum, and you go too far. When you react and pull away, oftentimes the pullback is too far, and you go to another extreme. And Luther's extreme was, there is no action necessary. You don't need to do anything except believe in your heart and that is it, nothing else. And that seducing spirit has moved through our society today. And it's given people a salvation that's unable to deliver them, a gospel that cannot keep them. Uh, Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of frustrated Christians that want to follow Jesus, but their, their mental confession is not enough to drive away sin. It's not enough to break the flesh. It's not enough to look at sin and have dominion over it and get that devil underneath their feet. Amen. If you're going to get dominion, you're going to need a little bit more than a mental confession and a verbal confession. You're going to need the power of the Holy Ghost. You're going to need the fire that falls upon the altar. You're going to need the name of Jesus so that you can run into the strong tower. Hallelujah. You're going to need a Bible salvation that can save To the uttermost. So there's no action needed at all. Well, the problem with that is right in the middle of the New Testament, we have the book of Acts. (laughs) It's not the book of ideas. It's not the book of thoughts. It's the book of Acts. (laughs) And James begins to deal with it. And they could prove the authenticity of what he was saying. And that the, the, the translators included it in the scripture. No, it's the genuine word of God. And what, what James dealt with is that just talking about it's not enough. Man, you've got to have action. I'm just going to throw something out there to you to try to help somebody. People will say, well, you, you say you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. They'll say, no, no, we're not saved by works. And you'll run into that before too long if you haven't already. Not saved by works. And, and people feel justified in saying that. They, uh, James 2 says we actually are justified by works. And, and, and it confuses people. Is it all right if I take a minute here? Is this, is this okay? I'm slip into teaching mode for a second. Because the word of God is good. James's works are different than works previous in the New Testament. Paul had to spend time in Romans 4 and throughout the book of Romans actually and he had to deal with the Jews because the Jews were caught up in, note the difference, works of the law. Now there's a difference between works of the law and action period. I'm going to tell you that to even have faith takes some work. A, A brain cell has to fire. Neurons have to fight. I don't know how much work that is on a cosmic scale, but it is work. There are chemical transitions that take place. Hey Amen. I know people think of works. They think of, you know, big actions and hand movements and things that you do. But I'm telling you that your brain has to think it. It is a work. One, one prophet, the apostle, even called it a work of faith. And so, so Paul, dealing with the Jews told them, you are not justified by works. And he would use that phrase, not justified by works. And then he would qualify it later in the chapter by the works of the law. He didn't mean no action. He meant circumcision can't save you. He meant the Sabbath day can't save you. 
He meant the high priest and the shedding of blood and, and lambs and bullocks and goats can't save you. He meant that the works under the Levitical and, and, and Mosaic covenant could not save you. He didn't mean you're not going to have any action at all. He meant that Moses' law was insufficient and it is by God's grace that we stand and by the administration of Jesus Christ who is the great high priest. That's how we're saved. God's not trying to take away action. God's trying to tell you that the law cannot save. And so when they say, oh, we're not saved by works, they're quoting Paul who was talking to a Jewish audience about Jewish ceremonial observances. When you get baptized, yes, you have to get in the water. Yes, you have to. You have to be willing and make the choice. But, but, but you're simply obeying. It's God that does the work. Amen. Hallelujah. When you repent of your sins, the preacher doesn't forgive you. The work is done by God. You can't forgive yourself. Your neighbor can't forgive you. But when you repent of your sins and confess your sins, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. God does the forgiving. God does a supernatural work in your life. It's not my work. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. <laughs> when you get baptized... God washes your sins away under the watery grave of baptism by the applying of the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you get the Holy Ghost, you're not the one bringing the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is poured out upon you. Hallelujah. Somebody's got to do the pouring. And that somebody is Jesus Christ. He pours out his spirit upon us and he fills us he does that work he puts his spirit within us he puts his nature inside of us it's not my works it's his works and without him I could do nothing amen I'm going to tell you that there there is action on our part that must take place if you read James chapter 2 closely <laughs> what, what, what he says is that if a brother or sister is naked and they don't, they don't have their daily food, they're destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, there's a lot of saying that goes on, but I'm not interested in the lip service, I'm interested in the work itself. One of you say unto them, depart in peace. I always laugh when I read that. It just makes, it's not funny, but it just makes me laugh. I can just see that. Depart in peace. Be ye warmed. And here they are. They have nothing. <laughs> Be ye filled. God bless you now. Have a good day. We'll see you. <laughs> You've spoken words. But you haven't done anything. There's a lot of people. That's their salvation. They've spoken words. But they haven't done anything. Hallelujah. There is a book of Acts dynamic that has to happen in a person's life. And it's a whole lot more than just talking it into the air. It's a whole lot more than just thinking it with the mind. Hallelujah. Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? I want to show you it talks about an Abrahamic faith. It's, it's a Bible faith. Abraham is the father of the faithful. He is our preeminent example. I'm going to come to a close. But I go, I've got to get it across to us this morning. He is the example we follow. I don't follow the Pope. I don't follow Buddha. I don't follow uh, Martin Luther. I don't follow John Wesley. I follow the word of God. I, I follow Abraham. I follow Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm getting into the scriptures. That's my example. That's my blueprint. That's my pattern. And so the Bible says, it's a powerful, powerful portion of Scripture. You believe there's one God, great. Devils believe too. There is a satanic belief. They know how to believe, but they cannot have action. Faith without works is dead. There's a deadness to it. And then it says, Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. 
And then it says something powerful after that. Verse 22, do you see how faith wrought with his works? <laughs> I like that. That word wrought is the same word that we use for wrought iron. And it means iron that is curiously woven. It's woven together. It's intertwined. It's, there's movement to it. It's moving together. Wrought with his works mean it was crafted with it. And the Bible says, by works was his faith made perfect. That, that, that word perfect doesn't mean flawless. It means entire. It means complete. That means just thinking it and believing it is not enough. you got to put the action with it. And when you put the action with it, the action with the faith is wrought together. And it is made entire. It is made perfect. And then the scripture is fulfilled that Abraham believed God. As long as it was in his head, Abraham had not believed God. But the moment he began to put one foot in front of the other and began to walk and begin to put action to what he was doing. Hallelujah. His faith combined with his action. And that's when the scripture says Abraham believed God. Well, I just believed in the Lord and that's what I did. Honey, that's not enough. You've got to put your action with it. You've got to do it. You've got to obey the word of God. You Come on. You've got to have an Abraham faith that says I'm walking up this mountain. I'm obeying Oh, hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Read your Bible, brother. Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Noah built. By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Abraham went. By faith, by faith. There's always an action that accompanies the faith. Hallelujah. When you get in that tank and you're baptized in Jesus' name, the works of your obedience wrought with the faith of the word of God. And it makes it perfect. It makes it entire. And you believe. I believe. I believe in God. Hallelujah. He that believeth on me, not the way this world says, but as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hallelujah. It's not about religion. It's not about denomination. Honey, it's about the Holy Ghost. And when you believe, you're going to get the Holy Ghost. You're going to get baptized. You're going to repent of your sins. Abraham believed God. It's not a generic belief. It's a curiously wrought belief. Justified by works. I'm coming to a close. I just want to share one last, maybe two last things with you. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Hey man, this is why church services are dead. Until somebody starts acting. Amen. You can sit there all day long and believe in God. But now, honey, you got to put those little hands together. <laughs> this is a book of Acts, church. You've got to put the action with your faith. You've got to put the, oh, glory to God. Hey, hey, let me, let, me just, let me just break it down to where we live. You ever meet somebody that can't get the Holy Ghost? They probably don't have them here in Memphis. They did in Florida where I'm from. We had folks that they just couldn't get it. And let, let me tell you something about folks that can't get the Holy Ghost. It's going to be one of two things. They either haven't repented of their sins or, number two, they can't have the faith for it. Because I promise you it's not a problem on God's part. God is more than ready to fill people with the Holy Ghost. God's standing on tiptoes waiting to give people the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know who has trouble getting the Holy Ghost oftentimes? Smart people. Rich people. They got a tough time getting the Holy Ghost. One of the reasons why is because they don't understand how faith works. They come up here and they pray and the Holy Ghost will move on them. The power of God will be all over them. And they'll sit there and they'll cry and they'll shake and they'll tremble. And if you never get past that point, you can spend 40 years doing that. Waiting on something. You tell them, believe God. You tell them, hang on, hang on, hang on, it's right there. 
You tell them, let go, let go, let go. <laughs> and they're going. <laughs> Shake them. Shake them into the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Massage them into the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Usually the problem is that the promises of God are caught in their mind. The wealthy, the smart, they're doers. They're people used to control. They're people used to grabbing life by the horns and making it happen. And it's an asset in life, but it's a liability in the spirit. Jesus said, how hardly shall a rich man enter the kingdom of God? I don't want to preach too long about it. I'm just trying to tell you. They'll sit there waiting on, and they'll say, it's so hard. And while they're saying it's so hard, a four-year-old will be getting the Holy Ghost over here on the other side. It's not hard. You have to become converted and become like one of these little ones. Except you become as one of these, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. It's not that it's hard. It's that you can't let go of control. Let me tell you something about the Holy Ghost. There comes a point where your faith has to mix with your works. Amen. I had a guy come to the altar. He came for a year. And finally, he had come so many times, he finally looked at me and said, I can't do it, Pastor. I'm, I'm the one evil man in the world that can't get the Holy Ghost. It just jumps right over me. It leapfrogs over me. I'm a reprobate. And then he starts going into the Bible. Have I done the unpardonable sin? Have I? <laughs> you know, and the Holy Ghost is all over him. He just doesn't know how to yield to it. And, 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 and I would see him, and he would be up there, and he would beg and God, please, please give me the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and he's trying to work his way into faith. And I'm, I'm over there going, calm down, brother. <laughs> Relax. It's a gift. You're saying, give it to me, and God's going, take it, take it. <laughs> and, and finally, one day he said, that's it. I got to get it. I'm, I'm desperate. About a year had passed. And I said, Paul, if you believe... Do you believe? Yes, I believe. I said, then you, you're getting the Holy Ghost tonight. We're not leaving this church till you're getting the Holy Ghost. If it's 5 o'clock in the morning, we're, you're getting the Holy Ghost. And he came up and he was praying. He, he did it again, man. He just tightened up and he was, it was like he was bench pressing 300 pounds. And, 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 and I finally stopped him. I said, Paul, what are you waiting on? I don't know. Maybe like an angel to take my tongue. <laughs> I said, no, you just believe. And speak. The Bible says that you confess with your mouth. And you believe in your heart. That's what it says. That's not, that doesn't mean, Lord, I confess you, I believe. That means you're going to speak in tongues. You confess with your mouth. And you believe in your heart. Well, I, I, that's me. I can't do that. That's me. I said, that's not you, brother. You have got to put works with your faith. You've got to let it twine together. You've got to put your action, your believing. You speak it out. You just speak it in faith. The Holy Ghost is all over you right now. Now, you believe it and speak it. Now, I'm going to lay hands on you, Paul. And when I do, I don't want you to think about it. I don't want you to fret about it. I don't want you to stress about it. You open your mouth and just speak in Jesus' name. He said, I can't. I said, yes, you can. <laughs> He threw his hands up in the air. I laid my hands on him, and he just started speaking. The Holy Ghost hit him like a lightning bolt. Knocked him. He spoke in tongues for two hours, laying on the floor, just speaking with tongues as the Spirit of God came upon him. Because faith wrought with his works. Faith wrought with his works. You got to... My God, somebody has to walk up Mount Moriah. Somebody has to build the boat. Somebody has to speak it out. And God meets you halfway. Faith without works is dead. Hallelujah. You're justified by your faith and by your works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. Stand with me this morning. He got up out of that place. He said, Pastor, if I knew it was that easy, I would have got the Holy Ghost a year ago. <laughs> Amen. I just believe God's able to do it. Amen. Somebody lift your hands with me this morning. Somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house right now. I, there's a spirit in Christian, Christian life that is saying, we're, we've got the faith. We've, we've got this faith. We're here in Memphis and we're going to proclaim this truth. We're going to preach this truth. We're going to live this truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody open up your mouth. Somebody open up your hands, your heart, and lift your voice to God. Hallelujah. Help me praise Him. Hallelujah. By faith. By faith. By faith. By faith.